Howdy folks, in this video we're talking about a little piece of the Pokemon world, namely Sprout Tower. Now why might this short, nearly skippable piece of their second generation game be of any interest from an engineering perspective? Well, that's what we're going to get into today. As though I really need to buff my nerd credentials, I've always loved the Pokemon games, and even recently found myself dusting off the old Game Boy Advance. While leveling up and catching uh, most of them, I'm noticing things I just didn't see before. So, although the world of Pokemon centers around the unique abilities of elemental creatures, they do exist in a setting, and while the first generation leans into a somewhat Japanese architectural style, though you could be forgiven for not noticing it since they're often pretty cubic. Now, this comes to a head in a few distinct locations, one being the Tin Tower, but also the oft-forgotten Sprout Tower. So, generally speaking, these buildings all pay homage to the East Asian pagodas with their multi-eaved roofs and heavy timber construction, but something unique to the Sprout Tower, and the whole reason for this video is, what's going on with this thing? I mean, I get it. We're in a building named after the dopey tulip Pokemon, so why not pay him his due and mimic his flimsy little body in the building's form? And maybe that's simple enough. Though, typically, architectural references to Pokemon are usually just shown in the form of statues and sculptures, so why was it that this early game dungeon gets this feature? In fact, when I saw the wobbling vine running up the middle of the tower that's not even connected to the floors, leaving the rest of the structure to just float, I thought, this is dumb, and figured that the game's developers made a bad attempt at describing part of the structural system with this silly little flower stem. But as it turns out, it is I who is the dumb one. Before going too much further, I realize that we'll need to go into a bit of background discussion on pagodas before tackling Sprout Tower head-on. So, uh, Japanese pagodas are traditional tiered towers that are typically associated with Buddhist temples, though they can also be found near Shinto shrines. Uh, these structures have a long history in Japan and across Asia in general, though the form we see for Sprout Tower is distinctly Japanese, and part of what makes this so is the wood framing, square plan shape with pronounced eaves, as pagodas across Asia can be found in various shapes, including square, hexagonal, octagonal, and using other building materials like stone and brick. And some don't even bother with the gabled roofs. I mean, just try doing that with stone. Now, as mentioned, many Japanese pagodas are deeply intertwined with Buddhism and its symbology. Uh, for example, the five-story pagoda is often associated with the five elements, uh, earth, water, fire, wind, and space. And of course, there's a lot of deep significance to the elements of the pagodas, but I don't want to just regurgitate research. That topic should probably be covered by someone more intimately familiar. But I can speak to the fact that these pagodas are some of the oldest constructed buildings in Japan, with several shrines over 400 years old. And there were even some built over a thousand years ago that were ultimately damaged and needed to be rebuilt. But most interestingly, uh, not a single pagoda in Japan has been felled due to earthquakes, and we'll get into that a little bit later on. Now, one of the three most revered pagodas in Japan, the Ruriko G Tower, is a five-storied building that's part of a Buddhist temple complex. It is hollow with a five overlapping wooden eaves at each level. Inside is a central pillar called a Shinbashira that is anchored to the ground, but only touches the finial at the apex of the tower, and, you know, that sounds pretty familiar. So, heading back into the world of Pokemon, uh, something pretty unique to the series is how many times it's been adapted and reimagined. There's manga, anime, games, re-releases of those games, trading cards, and all give slightly different perspectives on that world, and to me, that's just so enjoyable. As far as the depictions of our Sprout Tower goes, while in the Pokemon Adventures manga, the Sprout Tower only shows up in a few panels with some vague exterior shots, the Johto Journey's anime gives us a lot more to work with. So in the episode about with Sprout, we've got our Ash Ketchum, Team Rocket, and so on engage with the tower while on a school field trip, and it looks like we'd expect a Japanese pagoda look and a nice depiction of what's represented in the gameplay with a three-story wooden structure, intermediate levels, and even has a balcony, but it also has the critical bell sprout stock, the Shinbashira. And while the voice actors keep calling it a beam... That beam sways just like a bell sprout. The tower supported by one beam... Even worse than when people call concrete cement, and if you're not sure why I'm so tilted, beams are horizontal, columns are vertical. That's it. 
Anyways, uh, what is pretty cool about this episode is that it pays a pretty good respect to the architectural engineering and the history of the pagoda. Uh, Team Rocket first smokes the field trip out with a wheezing, uh, imitating a fire, which is the most common cause of destruction for wooden Japanese pagodas. Uh, next, uh, Jesse and James use their Pokemon to try and actually cut the Shinvashira uh, before blasting off again uh, through the side of the structure, causing something resembling uh, an earthquake response. Now, moving on to the RPG, the, the nice thing about the free roaming games is that m most parts of the map, interior and exterior, at least has a representation, even if there may not be much dialogue or description. Both the original Gen 2 games and the remake depict Sprout Tower with three floors, like the anime, and shows the central pillar detached from the adjacent floor swaying about in Bellsprout fashion. Now, as a trainer, we encounter monks and battle their Bellsprouts, climbing up the tower like we might expect. Now, the interior of the structure of many of these wooden pagodas, especially the more slender types, don't typically have floors infilled at each level, but obviously the game would have let us down if we were to enter a tower only to find it had just one floor. But as with much religious architecture, additional attention is paid to effects like this that get patrons to look up and think outside of oneself. And while that may be many people's MO, if I'm looking up, I'd probably be more interested in what the structure is up to. And I don't think I'm the only one. This paper by these fine authors dives into an analysis of that structure type and lists out four primary factors affecting the earthquake resistance of ancient pagodas, using the Horyuji Temple as an example. These factors are sliding between base stones and columns and the gaps between the wooden joints, friction damping effect of the mortise and tenon wood joints, the balancing toy or snake dance effect, and the Shinbashira. So how do these effects work? Well, the first two relieve the stress of the structural elements by allowing them to move in a way that isn't destructive while resisting the motion through friction. The mortise and tenon joints of woodcraft is great for this effect, and consequentially this flexible motion allows for the eaves of the pagoda to act as a rebalancing force when pinned about a central point, creating a restoring force that counteracts the motion caused by the earthquake, which is similar to how the Shinbashira works, acting not only as a tuned mass damper acting out of phase with the rest of the building, but also resolving horizontal forces by impacting the adjacent structure as it wobbles up the height. And the conclusion of these researchers on which of the several factors played the biggest role is proper building maintenance by the stewards of the built environment. A, a rather cute conclusion, despite lacking in clear definition, maybe the authors from uh, Takenaka Corporation didn't quite get the funding from their um, Department of Building Restoration. <laughs> maybe I, I shouldn't get my research from advertisements disguised as academic papers. Please do not fight me, Mr. Takanaka. Now, to tie in this discussion with some comments that relate back to the modern world, though some of you may have already been thinking about this, but the earthquake resistance of Sprout Tower and the ancient pagodas have some similar qualities to Taiwan's famous Taipei 101. And not just due to its multi-tiered design, which pays obvious homage to the historical architectural form, but in how it attempts to manage the effects of an earthquake. It's not that often that a tower's tourism is drawn not only for its views of the surrounding landscape, but also because of its structural system, but that's exactly what goes on at Taiwan's tallest building, with its enormous tuned mass damper seated in the upper reaches. The effect that this structural element has is pretty similar to the Shimbashira in that it intends to counteract the motion of the primary structure, providing a restoring force under intense lateral forces like those of an earthquake. And interestingly enough, the Tokyo Tree also uses this concept, but even more similarly with a slender core that is separated from the adjacent levels and only interacts through an oil-slicked bearings up the height. Now, quite exactly like uh, Shimbashira. Now, maybe this is more common than I think. Uh, are you familiar with any structures that uh, employ this technique? As a final thought, uh, I want to reference from a bit of a surprising source, uh, the martial arts book Refining Jin uh, by Philip Starr, I'll paraphrase a little bit below. The renowned sensei Akira Hino emphasizes jukozo, meaning flexible structure. The terribly destructive forces of earthquakes has led to the developments of new forms of architecture. However, this special type of construction existed in Japan long ago and is truly representative of Japanese culture and mindset. 
the ancient architects determined that rather than constructing buildings that would attempt to resist nature's power, they would design buildings that would attempt to adapt to nature. The joints in the buildings were not permanently fixed. Pillars and columns were constructed by the complex art of wood joining. This allowed for some play in the joints, which could absorb the shock of an earthquake. Coexistence with nature was preferred over the Western notion of trying to control nature or fight against it directly. This was the development of Jucoso. And hopefully one day, something resembling Jucoso gets added to Bellsprout's move pool. It seems that he's earned it. First, in closing, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry about the miserable pronunciations of Japanese words and titles, especially ones that, you know, uh, deserve respect. But that aside, I always appreciate your continued support through likes and comments, so if you have any suggestions for topics you'd like to see a video on, leave it down below. Uh, thanks again, and have a good one.